Hi, folks. Welcome back. And we have a wonderful session uh, with Deborah Farber um, on creative ways to champion privacy engineering awareness. She'll be joined by Kathleen Germel. They'll look for their interest. But yeah, enjoy the session and we'll see you in a little bit. Great. Thanks, Fernando. Well, hi, everyone. Welcome to our session. I think you're going to have, you know, we, we promise creativity. So I'm definitely going to bring the high energy level. I know Catherine can match it. First introductions, I'm Deborah Farber. I am a privacy tech advisor. I, I sit on advisory boards of several privacy tech companies, including Privato. Uh, I think I've been working with them about two and a half years now, and it's been wonderful. I'm also the host of the Shifting Privacy Left Pod, which, which Catherine has, has uh, been on an episode, which is sponsored by Privato. And we just reached our 50th episode last week. And I, so I urge you to check it out wherever you get your podcasts, you can find the Shifting Privacy Left podcast. I'm also 18 year practitioner in privacy, data protection, security, and governance. My entire career can be summed up as a shift left in privacy. Right out of law school, you know, I, I was looking for ways to operationalize privacy or even law, at first I was looking for a law firm to, you know, to work at, but none of, none of the firms had a specialty for privacy yet. Maybe there's one, maybe there's one or two. And I was in New York, so I think there was one or two there. And so I found that there were amazing opportunities, though, to go and work in operationalizing privacy because somebody needed to actually implement these, these rules and uh, attorney positions weren't the right roles for that. So I really cut my teeth on operations, did that for mostly 15 years. I, I'd probably been in almost every privacy role except a technical engineer. And and what I've realized over time is that you cannot, as I stated in the, in the welcome, if you, if you heard the welcome address for this conference earlier, you cannot protect privacy only with paper, right? With policies, proce uh, procedures, notices, uh, disclosures, they're all important, but that doesn't actually prevent the problems from happening. Uh, you need to shift the focus on preventing privacy problems into the product development lifecycle and not only focus on when data collection uh, happens and the data protection lifecycle. Super important. But if you have the right constraints built into your infrastructure, into your products and services, you minimize the data collection. You know, you, you have engineers that are, are, are in their own workflow, use something maybe like Provado that's actually going to surface privacy harms in your code before you ever push to production. And so I'm delighted today to have this discussion with Catherine, who I'm going to let her introduce herself. I've been plugging her book pretty much all day, Practical Data Privacy and Blocking Privacy and Security in Your Data. Go Thank get you. it. I really <laughs> think that this is like, this has been my Bible on the overlap of data science and machine learning with privacy. And with that, Catherine, please, I wouldn't do justice just, just not allowing you to talk about the highlights of your career. and. Who you are. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I've, I'm a privacy convert. I come from machine learning data. I've been doing machine learning for more than 10 years now. I guess now we call it AI, but I still call it machine learning because that's really what we're doing when we sell AI. We're just doing machine learning at scale. And I've been doing AI machine learning for 10 years. Before that, I was doing data at scale. So a lot of that was large scale data processing, data management, and so forth. So we now call it data engineering, but then we also didn't have that word. And before that, I actually first entered technology by working in data journalism. So I was at the Washington Post and got to work with an amazing group of reporters there helping assist their reporting with data. So I basically just, if I had to summarize it, I'm a math and statistics nerd that found my love for computing via data. I didn't like computer science before I learned about data. And then I moved into privacy, mainly because I was working in natural language processing. So I was working in machine learning with text data, and I was noticing a lot of problems from the ethical point of view and from the privacy point of view. And I thought somebody should do something about this. And I got introduced then to the world of privacy enhancing technologies. I worked at a company that built out some of the first encrypted machine learning that was used at scale and did some work alongside ways that we can do federated learning and make it safer and so forth. And then I joined recently or two years ago, ThoughtWorks, which is a large tech consulting. And I work as a principal data scientist with a focus on privacy and compliance. Awesome. 
Well, thank you so much for that. I, it, before we dive like really deep into the conversation today, I, why don't we define for the audience what we mean by privacy engineering awareness? And I'll let you or your answers even decide whether you want to talk about defining privacy engineering. But definitely want to highlight the awareness part because that's the crux of the conversation today. What are your thoughts? What's privacy engineering awareness? Yeah, I mean, I think it's still really interesting because to me, the field, so there's going to be some people that are in this, you know, in this room and in this conference that have been doing, you know, privacy engineering for 20 years, so longer than my career has been. And then there's going to be people like me that shifted to privacy engineering quite much later and with a very data science and machine learning focus. And I think like there's not fully a bridge between these two privacy engineering communities. And I would love to see more of that because as, as, I, as I think your experience can talk is like, we need all parts of the organization talking about privacy engineering and um, it can't be owned by just one part of technology. Um, however, um, I think that my view on privacy engineering is very future forward look. So it's very looking at uh, merging privacy technologies, thinking through things like cryptography, differential privacy, federated systems, and thinking through how can we advance beyond compliance? How do we actually build in privacy, in my opinion, as a core part of the data ecosystem and enterprise? And awareness of that then means First, how do I even learn about what the what is the word da- privacy engineering? Second, who's working on this? Because there's a lot of different rules and a lot of different skill sets. And three, how do I get people nerding out and excited about it? And I think your podcast is like a to getting oh. people aware and like the amount of amazing guests you've had, which are just reflect the I think vibrant community of privacy engineering out there. But what it what do you think's the problem with privacy engineering awareness? Oh, uh, well, I'll first define it. We uh, the problem with it. I mean, well, I'll get to that first. I, I would say that for me, privacy engineering awareness really refers to the, the understanding and integration of privacy principles. You get the practices and frameworks and considerations into the work of technical teams across an organization. So we need to ensure that everyone involved in the design, architecture, development, deployment, maintenance of the products or services, you know, et cetera, is knowledgeable about privacy and its importance in the design and operation of those products and services. Um, it, it, it just doesn't only help organizations comply with like data protection regulations. It really fosters a culture of responsible data handling. Uh, a culture of innovation uh, or ethical innovation, right? Ethical conduct. And then that ultimately leads to enhanced user trust, reduced risks, and a competitive edge. And so where do I think that there maybe were some problems with that? I think that because it's so new, you know, relatively like we're still trying to get this idea of shifting left into an organization to be a, to be a thing. You know, I could talk about it all day long, but it doesn't mean that it's happening within organizations. But I also think that technologists that are working on privacy engineering in their organizations, however that's defined within their organizations, are siloed as well, right? I mean, even if you're just talking about privacy enhancing technologies, as if that's just one thing, your cryptographers are not talking to your data scientists. I mean, they're just two different mathy worlds. I mean, not for the, for the most part, they're not. They're just different libraries and, and, and different ex- expertises were, you know, involved and, and maybe you've got, you know, if someone's going really deep into you know, learning how to, to deploy privacy enhancing technologies in the data science world, they probably don't have the time or expertise to also understand what are the problems in other areas of, 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 of the business. And so what I'm trying to do with the podcast is, is really just surface the interesting stuff that's going on, at, whether it's researchers who are you know, still doing research and testing out new technologies, you know, maybe it's in the AI space and they're trying to figure out, you know, what are the potential privacy problems that could go wrong? Or it's, you know, the stuff coming out of of universities isn't necessarily being seen by those in industry, right? And so, you know, there are gaps and we need bridges between all of these different current siloed areas of privacy, even across like technical privacy. And so, yeah, that's where I think the biggest uh, challenges are there. So for the rest of the conversation, we're probably going to talk a lot more about 
how, what are some creative ways to build, to, to bridge those gaps? Now, for, well, before that, I'll want to ask, what do you think has been, has led to it being so difficult to get organizational alignment on raising awareness for privacy engineering? Like within one organization, if you're trying to go and get, get the, you know, the, the political will to invest in this, why is it hard to get alignment? Yeah, I mean, I think you, I think you touched upon it already in not only the, your own work, but also kind of this thing of, are, is your research team talking with like, or are forward thinking leaders in your machine learning space or whatever it is you're working on actually talking with software engineers, actually talking with privacy stakeholders, actually talking with your CISO suite and your security org. Even at the most advanced orgs, there are dis, there are a lack of communication lines interconnecting between all these things. So for example, it can be easy to find privacy problems, but if it's part of technical debt, it might be difficult to say who actually owns this privacy technical debt and who's going to actually do something about it. Or if you have some really cool forward-thinking machine learning stuff, it can be difficult to say, oh, we're going we're gonna to pump the brakes on those people and their innovation by saying that they have to do everything with privacy engineering built in. But I think both of, both of our vision for some of the creativity is around how do we get a multidisciplinary group of stakeholders at an org excited about privacy? So right. like not just the privacy team and not just like a few nerds, you know, excited right. about privacy and then like actively working together and prioritizing some things that are manageable within the business goals and the business constraint. And I think that's really if you can get momentum behind that, I think that's what fundamentally shifts it into like a true privacy engineering organization where it's well functioning. And of course, that has to have the policy process side and the tech side and the people side, which is a lot of things to get going at once. It is, especially if you're coming in to a really well-established organization and trying to fit this retroactive, retroactively into the organization. I mean, it really is a yeoman's job. It, it, it really is. It's much easier to start with good practices from the beginning. All right, let's dive into some of the challenges to awareness and then opportunities to deploy creative privacy training, education, and awareness across an organization. We're going to break up this exercise by job function. So first, starting with like the, the CXO level, then marketing teams, privacy GRC and legal, and technical privacy folks. So first for your executives, let's discuss some of the executive level challenges when it comes to awareness of technical privacy issues. What are, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I have the uncomfortable position as a consultant to often tell organizations that the privacy risk that they think they're managing is larger than what they have on a spreadsheet, which nobody wants to hear, by the way, of course. You tell them that and their then... baby is ugly, basically. <laughs> this is one of the one of my favorite lines uh, uh, what I've heard about, you know, oh, yeah, people bring me in to, to tell so that I, they could say, look, look what we created. Please evaluate it. And you have to be like, your baby's a little ugly, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I think it's interesting because, you know, I come in often to do kind of, let's say, like strategic assessments and other things like this, which means you're talking with numerous levels of an organization. And what I often find is organizations often have fairly low psychological safety around talking about privacy risk, which is totally understandable because it's scary and it is scary. I mean, nobody wants to hear that. and People might not have the training or the skills not only to identify it, but also to assess it. And nobody wants to report, hey, I found a problem, but I actually don't know how to solve it. Right. That's a very uncomfortable conversation. So I think that is true. creating that is a huge problem. Yeah. Creating like risk assessments where psychological safety can enter and where people can feel safe saying like, hey, I found I found this thing or I saw this thing and I don't know, it doesn't feel right for me. It doesn't pass my privacy smell test. Can we look at it and have o having those open conversations? That is a way so that C-suite doesn't get sideswiped then later by finding out, oh, we're actually massively underestimating the amount of legal liability we hold because of how we're managing personal data. And now not only is our insurance invalid, but it's also like we are now... Uh, ooh, may or may not assess ourselves in compliance as non-compliant, 
And now we have to retroactively spend a bunch of money that we didn't expect to spend. Right. Which, right. Right. Which, and also upend maybe people's current workflows and how they're, you know, uh, what they've committed to completing for that quarter or year or whatnot. So it could be very disruptive to the business to find this out retroactively. I think I, I'm going to I'm going to add my own uh, two cents to this as well. Uh, I think there's several challenges that I've seen, like limited technical understanding executives, they just might lack a deep technical understanding of the systems and processes that are involved in data co collection or deriving data, storage process and processing of that data. This can hinder their ability to make informed decisions about privacy-related technical matters. Like you said, they might, they might already think that they have addressed a problem when they really haven't addressed it appropriately. Thus, priorities are often misaligned where executives prioritize business objectives over privacy considerations. And this could lead to decisions that prioritize profit over growth at the expense, and sorry, profit and growth at the expense of data protection and privacy. Um, executives who don't fully grasp the technical aspects of privacy, uh, they might not allocate the appropriate resources, give you the budget that you need or the, the headcount. Um, for cybersecurity measures and data protection initiatives. And this might leave the organization vulnerable to breaches. The very thing you're trying to prevent in the first place. Well, maybe not the thing, but one of the bigger things that is easier to me uh, measure. And then also executives may be resistant to implementing technical changes that prioritize privacy because they have concerns about the associated costs, potential disruptions, or the perceived impacts on business operations without appropriately balancing those costs with the money saved from data minimization, the prevention of data sprawl in the first place, the reduction of breaches and associated legal costs, and earning and maintaining trust with stakeholders. Yeah, yeah, I see you nodding. So we're in agreement. I mean, I yeah, and I feel like if you tell a CEO, look, if you're going to have a massive breach and you're going to have to report in and do a big payout, I mean, everybody's only going to get like 25 cents each, but they'll remember that you wrote them a check for 25 cents. So that's going to stick in their head. And if they have a choice to walk away and go somewhere else, I mean, the the only thing that you can definitely have as a company is trust a trust bond with your customers. That is the only thing that you can definitely hold for a very long time. And I think that's really important. That's really cool that you focus in on that. Awesome. Great. Okay. So what are some creative ways that we can use to gain awareness for technical privacy issues at the executive level or the you know, C-suite? C-suite creativity around privacy. I mean, I think just even the actual, I mean, I don't know what you actually think about this, but getting C-suite to sit through a risk assessment, I think is very difficult. That's a difficult, that's a very expensive yeah. risk assessment. <laughs> but I think elevating the fact that when they choose to sign off on a budget, putting privacy as a line item in there and making it visible, look, you're investing in privacy and here's the ROI we expect in consumer trust that we're building in the fact that we're going to reduce our liability for print in the fact that we're reducing risk and that's helping your DPO sleep at night, these types of things, I think it's worth starting to call it out. And I think most C-level understands the competitive advantage of not giving away all your data uh, to all of your third-party sharing vendors and this type of thing. And I think one way, I mean, obviously I've worked a lot in data sharing and advanced privacy for data sharing purposes, with the sole purpose that either a company needs to get data via advanced privacy technology or a company would like to maintain data advantage but still have data sharing agreements by using advanced technology so they're not just giving a copy of their data to whomever asks. And I definitely think that that message hits at sea level. But that's yeah. not so creative. What <laughs> thoughts do you have? What's, what's creative? What else do I have? Well, a book club idea. Might be, because we're going to have a few book club ideas throughout throughout this, would be maybe maybe getting a copy of the Privacy Engineers Manifesto, getting from policy to code to QA to value, which is co-authored by Michelle Dennity, one of my heroes, and Jonathan Fox, when they were both back at Cisco. Jonathan's still there. And in addition to Michelle Dennity's father, who's passed, but an amazing engineer. 
And I think that they, this could really, the book itself really demonstrates that gap between like lawyers being vague in the way that a policy is set on purpose so that things can maybe fit under that definition in the future and they can cover, cover your ass kind of, kind of idea. Whereas your technologists really need very specific requirements that they're testing to. And this huge disconnect in between, you know, this book is really about that. And how can you, you know, it was the first book on privacy engineering, uh, I believe. And it's, I read it when it, immediately when it came out and it kind of kickstarted my thought process around how I needed to think about privacy a little differently. So I think, you know, executives can really benefit from that. And maybe a privacy exec in, in an organization can kind of lead a roundtable discussion. And so, you know, I think that that, even though you're taking up time of executives, going to hone some of those bullet points, even if they've skimmed through it and didn't get a chance to read through the whole thing in a book club. The second thing is threat modeling. So, you know, there's for breach response, there have been these tabletop exercises where you do get all the related executives together from, you know, the respective teams that need to respond. So everyone from PR to your chief security officer to potentially the CEO and, you know, various members of their team. I'm probably leaving some people out. Legal is important, of course, right? The point is, I know those things are happening and I know they're really structured and you kind of, a tabletop exercise would be like, you're going through like a mock breach and then you walk through, well, this happens and I'm going to do this and this is what I do here. And, and then you start to see and stress test it and see where are there problems potentially with this and let's redocument it and get, it, you know, so that when we do have a breach, we can respond and accordingly and maybe, you know, keep that trust with customers and stakeholders and such. What I want to point out is that there are definitely, like maybe you could do conduct tabletop exercise related to threat modeling for privacy or threat modeling for privacy and AI, you know, to demonstrate how their employees should be making decisions about using personal data within products and services. And so really creative resources for this include the Linden Privacy Threat Framework and the Linden Go card game. So there's a card game with the different threats and you can really play it with the product teams, executives, it depends, whoever you want to engage on, you know, putting down the different threats and then seeing how could we, how could we mitigate this threat and, 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 and start, that's how you really get creative in, in problem solving. And then there's also, it's lesser known because it, it was based on Linden, but there's right, the R-H-I-T-E, it's an organization based in Europe by Isabel, I'm blanking on Isabel's last name, but she's created the Privacy Library of Threats for AI, which she calls Plot for AI, Privacy Library of Threats. And then she's also got an associated card game. So you could play this, you know, if you specifically want to do around privacy and AI and understand like what threats are we talking about when people keep talking about privacy and AI, I don't understand. The executives can really learn from playing this game. So anything else to add? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I got I got invited into a large organization that was running a one week security camp. And unfortunately it was mainly in the CISO suite and down, but it had several executives also from data. And I gave them some challenges to try to hack some LLMs. So right. I think it could be really fun that I know that you have uh you have a strong relationship with the security community to reframe it as how do we expose privacy risk, but make it playful? And I think that's like, that's a nice way to also start to add psychological safety because they go through this like game and they're like, oh no, that was really stressful. But then it's like, oh, okay, but it's just a game. Can we start to, how can we start to build this so that it's not just a game as part of our normal conversations? I think that's really cool. Yeah. That's, that's actually a really great point. Really great point. Well, let's now turn to the marketing function. You know, why should marketing teams shift privacy left? And, you know, what are some of the challenges that they are uh, facing there when it comes to privacy engineering awareness or technical privacy awareness? I'll just frame it that way for, for because I don't know how many marketing teams and privacy engineers are like like this yet, you know? <laughs> so, you should, they should be. Oh, my they God. Should be. Okay. That's the end so, of if you're a privacy engineer, all you got to do is you got to go talk to marketing and they will love you forever because because of all the changes that have happened, obviously, with third party cookies, with the sunsetting of cookies as a normal way that marketers track people, which, of course, is a good win for privacy regulation and privacy practice. 
but is kind of often now leading to a not so great win for people that don't want to rely solely on something like Google or Apple ads or Facebook ads or something like this. And so the entire ad world is shifting. It's changing. Even the, all the big ad places are starting to change some of the protocols they use and are now deploying more and more advanced technology to do some of the things that they used to do with less advanced technology. Marketers are kind of left, uh, in, you know, I'm going to use a very American phrase, they're left holding the bag. You know, they're supposed to meet all their same numbers. They have way less information than they used to have. And marketers, I don't think the average, like if uh, I've worked with a lot of marketing departments, so maybe I have a little bias, but I don't think marketers actually care. Like they don't want to track you in individually and they only want the benefit that they see from personalized or targeted ads. I don't think that they necessarily want all of the other privacy implications of those ads. and so. I think working with your privacy department, often they're forgotten about in your tech landscape. They have a, a huge privacy problem that they own. And it's good for business to improve marketing and conversion, right? So I don't want everybody smart in the world working on ads, but I think that from an organizational perspective, this is a main way that your organization either grows or shrinks. And I think empowering marketing people to think differently about how to do their job with privacy built in can be a huge shift in conversation. And you could actually, in my opinion, they hold a, quite a bit of privacy risk in an org, and they often have fairly low privacy maturity, which is totally fine. But you can be a driving force for awareness. You can help them actually ship use cases. And if you change the way that data sharing works at your org, which often data sharing originates in marketing or sometimes it's related to marketing, you can have a fundamental impact on the privacy risk and footprint at the org overall. So I would just say, like, I know that everybody wants to be like pure and like I don't work with marketing, but I don't know why, because I think like that's really who you should work with. And they they got the real problems. What do yeah, you think, absolutely. Deborah? In fact, some, someone just asked, why do engineers need to talk to marketing? Isn't the existing privacy manager able to handle those conversations? Um, and I think, why not? Could you talk a little bit about why engineers, you know, they're managing the tech stacks for marketing, right? So your privacy managers aren't typically doing that. Do you have more to add to that? Yeah, sure. I mean, so when you think about where an org is situated now, when they've been using maybe a few different vendors that may or may not be available due to changes in the California privacy regulation space, as well as the European privacy regulation space, as well as changes that Google has made to their browsers and ad infrastructure and changes that Apple has made to their browser infrastructure. So all of that is happening at once, right? And the way that they've done their job up to this point will fundamentally change. And at orgs that are that have data science capabilities and have machine learning capabilities, they're actually now often talking about and considering ways to accumulate data and to still do their marketing function. And for the most part, those conversations at less advanced organizations, those are conversations now with vendors that are selling things like data clean rooms and other types of technology to solve this problem. I would advocate that this is one of the riskiest parts of an organization and that if you have the capabilities, you should be doing it in-house. And that means actually prioritizing having your engineers talk with marketing and deciding what parts of the privacy and data science problem do we want to own here and what parts do we want to outsource to a, a third-party vendor and if we do choose a third-party vendor, how do we actually evaluate that the privacy risk is reduced significantly? And how do we actually evaluate that the technologies used are technologies that we trust? And I think that that's, that's why I advocate that you make friends with your marketing team because they're being given the option, do your job and tell us how much it's going to cost and what vendor we want to buy from. And if you can actually inform that conversation with real privacy engineering you can fundamentally change the way marketing works at your org. Thank you for that. I think that's a really great answer. And then quickly, because we have nine minutes left and we could talk for hours, you know, what, what are some creative ways to gain awareness for technical privacy issues across marketing and 
analysis teams. Of how to raise marketing. How to raise well, privacy start- engineering. I'm so in preparation for this for this, I think you had mentioned one of the things is make privacy fun and hard again. <laughs> you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, and I think that they love to hear use cases that have actually happened. So both in my book and I'm working actually on a little mini series for a newsletter I run. I run a little newsletter for data nerds called Probably Private. You can sign up at probablyprivate.com. But I've been studying the new protocols that marketing teams at places like Google Meta or like Alphabet Meta and Apple have been releasing. Because obviously they're also affected by all these third-party cookie changes. And they're developing whole new protocols to address like literally cryptographic protocols, different types of data sharing protocols to address the changes that they've introduced themselves. And I think obviously your marketing team doesn't want to read about protocols. Please don't. But, But drawing out with them, like here's a cool thing I read about. Like, what if we're org A, you know, our data sharing partners org B, what, okay, here's one way it could look like. Here's another way it could look like. Here's a third way it could look like. And getting them engaged at this high level conversation really, I think, makes them super curious. They want to learn more. And I think it makes it fun because they're like, oh, I didn't even know we could do that. How does that work? And yeah. Can yeah, so it's kind forward. of get engaging the curiosity aspect that 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 people have, and that's awesome. I, I think that's a really creative idea. My my contribution to what's a creative idea here would be a book club, maybe you know, maybe reading something like "From Data Driven to People Based Marketing: Successful Digital Marketing Strategies in a Privacy First Era" by Marco Hassler. That could be a really nice conversation starter. And then next, we're going to turn to, and I know we have on the on this watching right now, we have many people from privacy, GRC, and legal. And we're going to just jump right into what are some creative ways to gain awareness for technical privacy issues across privacy, GRC, and legal, because we just start for time. So asking you that. Yeah. So, I mean, in the in the book that I wrote, I have a whole chapter on like working, crossing, the bridging the divide between kind of the legal regulatory stakeholders and then the engineering and data people. I think building a privacy glossary together is a really fun game. Maybe it's not so creative, but where the legal folks come to the table with terms you might not know and where we use the policies and what do they mean. And the technical and data folks come to the table with like, here's what data pipelines do, and here's what this does, and here's what that does. And you create this, via that you create, of course, a living document that can be this privacy glossary. And you also engage in reducing the, the I mean, a lot of technical teams are afraid to go to privacy for advice because they don't want to be told no. So you're also bridging a little bit of psychological safety there. What have you seen work? Well, yeah, you know, I think the privacy privacy red teaming would 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 be helpful in in that as well. Or I think you want to talk about that. No, okay. And then there's some book. So so it's not so much of what I've seen work, but what things that I I am now going to recommend. Like there's a a Mark Sean Boyer. He came up with this Hitchhiker's Guide to Privacy Engineering. It's a series of newsletters and engaging creative storytelling, almost comic book style and putting a story around it that really tells that the the purpose is upskilling attorneys. He is an attorney himself at Bigley University in Turkey. He he runs the privacy, I think it's the Privacy by Design Center, the Privacy Excellence Center. I forget the the actual terminology, but it's aimed at upskilling attorneys to privacy engineering concepts. Then there's also another book, Strategic Privacy by Design by Jason Kronk who that I, you know, get the second edition. It's got like a hundred more pages and all of this other, all of the great stuff. And I think that really helps bridge the gap of how do you implement privacy into the business? And then some of that's technical. So where does that, where does privacy engineering kind of come in? And then one, one thing that I thought was outstanding was, and perfect for an executive level, if they're willing to dedicate 7.7 hours to it, is that open mind openmined.org has free courses out there. And the one I took, the one that was not too data science-y, data science nerdy for me, was around socio-technical training and it's, uh, sorry, socio-technical privacy concepts and really reframing privacy 
on society? And how do we, you know, you can't just think of it as a legal requirement. And they have this course called Our Privacy Opportunity. And it's absolutely outstanding. I've, was, I've been in privacy forever and it's, it, it, it really blew me away. I thought, excellent, go check it out. And then with three minutes left, we're going to just race through some creative ways that technical privacy folks, your developers, architects, and IT staff can raise awareness for privacy, you know, technical privacy. Yeah, I love building the red team and the threat modeling thinking, right? Because a lot of the large orgs, they do have privacy red teams that actively goes out and tries to find threats. The one danger there is who owns the backlog that the red team finds. So you need to make sure that if you're do if you're running those exercises and you actually want to bring them to fruition, somebody also has to own the backlog and the the debt that's found, uh, the privacy technical debt that's found, and then. I love the idea of doing, you know, uh, book clubs at a variety of levels, learning programs at a variety of levels. So inside ThoughtWorks, I run a technical training program for our privacy champions, and we have privacy champions across the organization. And if you want a little certification that you understand technical privacy, you have to have gone through my course and taken a quiz at the end of these types of things. And so I think that making it a team sport and a team conversation. We also have a privacy champion, two conferences per year at ThoughtWorks, and we have an entire chat room where we talk about things. And I think if you can make it a community of practice, if your org is large enough, obviously ThoughtWorks is 14,000 people, so it helps. But it, regardless of the size of your org, if you can build a community of practice, you can build that enthusiasm and excitement, hopefully, for the work. Absolutely. And I'll, pl- I'll throw in there, I'm going to plug Pravado's Technical Privacy Masterclass led by Nishant Bajaria. Honestly, he's distilled so much wisdom down into this course. It's compelling. It's just go take it. It's free. But Pravado offers it. You can go find it in their, their resources area of their website. These are, these are things that you could use on your team to help upskill your 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 non-privacy folks, right? They really can understand what does it take to, to do this technically. Open Mind, I mentioned before, they have free data science courses focused on privacy, an eight-hour course called Introduction to Remote Data Science, and then 60-hour course called Foundations of Private Computation that I believe focuses on federated learning. So, uh, you know, go check that out. These are also, like I said, things that your teams, you could all do together and then maybe talk about and they, they have a whole community of, I think, 16,000 people or a member of their Slack community. It's great. It's great. The other thing I want to call out is the Privacy Quest platform. It's kind of taking the security uh, capture the flag type gains, making that whole like trying to find the vulnerabilities in software in security and that concept of gamifying the security challenge, but doing it for privacy. And you're learning as you're as you go, and so I, I urge you to check out uh, Privacy Quest, um, and then different adversarial tests. So educate teams around various adversarial privacy tests, like privacy red teaming, undercover, and spotlight privacy vulnerabilities from an attacker's perspective. I would follow. Uh, I urge you guys to follow Rebecca Balabaco's work at uh, her organization, the Privacy Engineer. She's super focused on privacy red teams. And I know we're one minute over, so I'm going to close and just say thank you so much, Catherine. I, I mean, I could do a whole day worth of conversation. <laughs> so I, I, I just appreciate you sharing your knowledge today. Creative. Thank you, Tabitha. Thanks for the invite and the yeah, exactly. Make it fun. Make it hard and fun again. Thank you both. Thank you for always bringing all the resources, curated resources for for the community. This is super helpful. And I think oh, one we last need to thing. Um, my 50th episode of the Shifting Privacy Left podcast features my top 20 favorite privacy engineering resources. So all of this is, is there, and I'm soon going to be publishing that with Pravado as a blog post. So we want to make sure you have access to these resources. You can find the audio version and you can get a soon a, a written version. Thank you, Hernando. Thank you so much. Catherine. Yeah, thank you. 